Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Inquisitive Brain Podcast. I'm Shaw, your host. I hope that you're all doing well, and thank you so much for joining me today. And today, I'm very pleased to welcome Exeta Harris to the show. Exeta is someone I've known, uh, I met actually way, way back when, many years ago, and I'll talk about that later, but Exeta is a singer and an artist that is originally from Los Angeles, California. She now lives in New York City. And Exeta made a name for herself singing in the local clubs in California. And during the time where she was raising her two sons, she relocated to New York City and began a very successful career in the fashion apparel industry. She continues to use her creative talents in writing, songwriting, playwriting, and singing. Exeta is the widow of the late great comedian actor Robin Harris. And Robin passed away at a very young age in 1990. He was an actor comedian. He was in such films as I'm Gonna Get You Sucker with Keenan Ivory Wayans and Chris Rock. That was in 1988. He was also in Do the Right Thing with Samuel L. Jackson and Spike Lee. Also in Harlem Nights with Eddie Murphy, Richard Pryor, Red Fox. He was in House Party, the original, in 1990 with Tisha Campbell. And he was also in Mo' Better Blues with Spike Lee and Denzel Washington. Exeta started the Robin Harris Foundation, whose mission is to empower, to educate, to create, to motivate youth who are living in very underserved communities through mentorships and resourcing healthy nutrition and enhancing character development, which is very much missing in a lot of society these days. The Robin Harris Foundation helps people to reach their highest potential. She's also involved in other philanthropy, and we'll talk about that as well during the interview. And Exeta's singing. Now, we met at my cousin Lawrence Bolden's house. Lawrence, my cousin, is a bass player. He has since passed away uh, due to health problems. But Lawrence and I, our first cousins, were very, very close, knew each other growing up. Our fathers are brothers. So we had a very close bond. I lived with Lawrence for a while in Los Angeles, and we're going to talk about that. And I met him. Lawrence was going to record a song. (laughs) Uh, I say song because uh, there wasn't a lot of singing for me. It was very, I was very into New Wave, and I was, I thought I was going to be Depeche Mode or Belinda Carlisle or um, Dale Bozio for Missing Persons. We were trying to do something like that. And Lawrence, I wrote a song, and Lawrence played all the music on it. And um, he, you know, I went round, we recorded it. Unfortunately, I don't have the tape. But what I did find was a tape of Exeta's session that Lawrence did with her. They recorded, Lawrence wrote the music, produced an entire album for Exeta. Uh, And unfortunately, you know, well, I had the tape. I don't know how I got, I, I think I do. Well, we'll talk about that. I do remember Lawrence just saying, look, I've done this album. Take it away. Have a listen. And, you know, I've, uh, it was a tape. He said, you can keep it. So this was, uh, this was many moons ago, many, many moons ago. And I was clearing things out and I found it. And I downloaded it and sent it to Exeta. And we're going to talk about that. It's amazing stuff. But I always remembered Exeta for her spirit. She was just such a lovely person. And we didn't spend a lot of time together at that point. I think I was leaving. Uh, She reminded me during the interview, actually, that I was on my way out kind of thing. And but we had a little chat and she she I just remember her spirit being so light, so lovely, so honest, so pure. And my cousin really liked her as well. I invited her on the show because uh, I I wanted to talk about her singing, but also her her connection to my cousin Lawrence. We ended up having a fantastic interview. 
I loved it, and I'm sure you will. We talk about motherhood. We talk about her philanthropy. We talk about um, my cousin Lawrence, his bass playing, who he played with. He played with some greats. And we also talk about spirituality and, you know, living in New York. She's, she's a California girl, but she's living in New York and has been for many years. And she's enjoying life. And she's just such a lovely soul. So without further ado, welcome Exeta to the show. Exeta, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for inviting me. It's just so good to have you here. Um, we have a little bit of a history, but we're going to come to that. I want to start out by talking about your history, your music history. Did you come from a musical family? No, not really. Not at all. Actually, well, my aunt played and sang in the church choir, but outside of that, no. As a teenager, I... um. I was involved in a teenage singing group with four girls. It was um, actually I was the oldest in the group, and they, they were younger than I. But it, it gave us something to do during those formative years, you know. And so it just kind of when the group disbanded, I just decided I would see see what I could do on my own. So I continued and. Um, Locally around Los Angeles, I, I did some local gigs, and um, I met Lawrence at one of those gigs, so he was our bass player for, for a while when we played at this one particular club, and then we just f formed a relationship. We began writing songs together, and uh, it just kind of went from there. Yes, wonderful. Well, you bring up Lawrence. Lawrence, <clears throat> for the viewers, he's my first cousin. I get a little... Throat, you know, croak in my throat because I do miss him. He passed away in 2018 from some health problems. Um, and so we're, ve we're very close. I'm going to add a picture in as well uh, with us. We're first cousins. Our fathers were brothers. So mm -hmm. that's how first we have the same grandmother, uh, you know, so very close. He grew up, we were right next door to each other. Okay. Yeah, for some years, um, but you know, we moved around for a bit. But they were all that they were my uncle Lawrence's brother, who I was very close to as well. I was very close to Lawrence's father, mm -hmm. my favorite uncles. He was so kind to me, always just so, even in his older age, and even when I lived moved to England permanently, he would ring me up and say, "Are you okay? Is everything all right? Have you heard from your dad?" <laughs> <laughs> He was, um, yeah, anyway, I digress. Sorry about this, guys. But okay, uh, Lawrence is a bass player. He played with many, as you know, many artists um, mm -hmm. like Irma Thomas. Um, I wrote some down. Willie West. Yeah, ZZ Hill. ZZ Hill, yes. And he last toured with Bobby Womack. Right. He had a stint with Bobby Womack. Um, I think I spoke to him briefly. He he was trying to get hold of me just to check in, um, and that was that was a few years before he passed away. So that's how you and I met. Right. Um, I was gonna. Go, he I think he rang me up and said, Are "You coming round today or something?" And I went there, and he said, "Oh, there's a lady that we're gonna be recording something. So and I want you to hear it." So when I went there, he said, here's a tape, take it, listen to it. And it was you. But then we met. We actually met. Right. You were leaving as I was arriving, I believe. There we go. There we go. Wow, your memory is better than mine. <laughs> yeah, so Lawrence, you know, you worked with him. What were those years? He's, he was a funny guy. He was funny. He could be quite funny. He's from New Orleans, you know, so... What was he like to work with? He was he was very easygoing to work with. Um, he was very creative. He could if you gave him an idea, your vision of what you know, how you interpreted something, he could pretty much envision the same uh, your idea. So that was really great because he never. If he thought something was off, he would voice his opinion, but in a gentle way. 
So it was really easy. I think I think that's why we got along so well because it was easy for me to tell him the ideas that I w had in mind, and then he just followed through and brought them to life. Wonderful. He always spoke highly of you. He one funny thing he said. He said she's gonna go far. He said, and she's good looking. Oh my god! <laughs> really? Yeah, he said she's gonna go far, and she's. He said, you know, that's important. He said, that's important. What are you going to do? What? <laughs> music. He said, you have to be good looking. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> he, he used to, you know, because I, I said to him, oh, this is really good. It was the slow one that I really liked as well. He said, she's going to do well. And she's good looking. He said, that's important. But that was so much Lawrence. That's who he was. He was. Oh, just, my God. <laughs> he was just. But you know, when we were kids, and he, he was a lot, six, seven years older than me. Uh -huh. Kid, he was playing bass. He would do nothing but music. And his mother used to shout, come in. He used to play basketball, do your homework. And he wanted to play his bass. So even as a child, young, young boy. Yeah, I could, he told me he had played at an, he began playing at an early age. And I guess for a lot of guys, or a lot of people in New Orleans, especially guys, music is a way of being creative, a way to escape or to go on to, um, you know, a bigger platform. And I mean, think about how many greats have come out of New Orleans. And even if you do, if you are not a big name, you were able to make a living just playing music. And our producing, our writing songs is just a, a, a rich history of musicians that have, you know, been born in New Orleans. <laughs> oh, yes. At one point, we had Ernie Cato living next door. Okay. And also, we had at one point the guy who wrote Little Green Apples. I can't remember. His name. Oh, yeah. He lived next door as well. Lawrence, yeah, he was next door. So we were around music. A lot, and my parents were friends with Big Do Big Joe Turner. Okay. So I have a picture. I remember seeing him back in the day in Los Angeles. He used to, you know, be around the circuit and jam sessions. Yeah, before he died, like maybe the last 10 years of his life. Wow. But I didn't know he was from, and I usually know that about, especially of the older uh, <laughs> artists. I usually don't. I usually know, you know, their history, but I didn't realize he was from Louisiana. Yeah, yeah, my parents were from Louisiana. So I have a picture of my parents, mom and dad, with Joe Turner. Oh, my God. Yeah, I've got a picture of that. I, I, I may post it. I will see. I, you know the internet. I'm always... <laughs> what I post. But, yeah, I've, I've got it. Um, and they look amazing. You could tell it was way before I was born, but... Right, and the, and their youth, and their prime. <laughs> exactly, they're sitting there with a cigarette and a drink. And <laughs> sat there as well. And I remember saying to my dad, "Who's this?" He said, "He was big. He was big." I said, "He yeah, was, he was big in the day." Yeah, and my dad said, "Yeah, he was huge." I said, "Well, who is he?" <laughs> big Joe Turner. Yeah, so that was interesting. Now you. Um, I want to ask you, Excel, about creativity because you write as well. I recently sent you a cassette, which we were talking about before we started. Were you able to listen to the music? I said, yes. yes. Secondly, okay. <laughs> it's wonderful. I was blown away because I had not heard it. And as long as you've had that tape. And I, I listened to it, and I wanted to send it to my son. And it was 5.30 in the morning on the West Coast. <laughs> so I had to wait. And he finally texted me maybe around 8 o'clock his time. And I told him about this, the cassette tape. And the first thing he said was, cassette. <laughs> Ancient. Ancient. Exactly. Because he's only like, he, was, he wasn't born when I did that, that, that tape, those recordings. So it was all amazing to him. A few of the songs he had heard before, because we had did other recordings, up, up, more updated 
since those original ones. But he listened to the first song. He didn't even listen to the entire song. He just immediately called me and was like, so what are we going to do with this? <laughs> and I found that tape and it said, Exeta, on, I don't have it in front of me, but it says Exeta and Lawrence. And I said, oh my God. So you had never listened to it? I had never listened to it. What? I think I had listened to it when he gave it to me. I tend, I, I kind of think he played it and said, "We just did this. He, he, you can take it." And wow! And, but but it's been all that time, and I thought, does this work? Does this? And the only way I could transfer it was to play it on the cassette player and and record it on my phone. So that's why it's not so great. But <laughs> it's the cassette as well. So. Well, I actually played it for a couple of other people live. And um, one of my close friends, I played it for her in the car on my phone. And wow. she liked every song on there. She was like, you got to be kidding me. And I said, she said, oh, my God, this is. And she's a lot younger than I am as well. So she was probably a kid, a little kid, like before double digits when I was actually doing that. And she was just blown away. And I played it for a couple of people at church after church on Sunday. And I only played the first tune. You know, you got to know me better. And they were like, and I said, this is my, you know, 35 years ago. My younger self in my late 20s, early 30s. <laughs> Gosh, amazing, isn't it? I mean, yeah. I must have it for a reason. I, yeah. And it's, it must be a reason that you contacted me when you did. I wanted to ask, did you write those songs? I wrote three of the songs. One song Lawrence wrote, and one was a cover song. Um, I wrote Got to Know You Better, Dark Side of the Room, and Follow Your Dreams. Those three I wrote. Dark Side of the Moon is... Just that hook it's just yes actually that was the first song that I ever wrote it was a poem I was just sitting in my apartment one night after a long day and I started putting the words on paper and then I um I was in a, a workshop and I asked uh the piano player I wanted to do that song in our um like our little graduation class. So she put some music together behind it. And then later on, or maybe a year or so later, I gave it to Lawrence and he actually put that entire thing together, the music track. So um, that was the first baby that I've, I ever wrote and put music to. And I've always loved that song. Even though it's a, it's kind of a dark song, but it puts you in a mood of, you know, enlightenment to yeah. kind of check your yourself where you are, the possibilities of where you can go because you don't need to stay in this dark place. Mm -hmm. So that's always been a baby to me. That's my first baby in music. But um, taste your love was right, um, well, not Robin, um, Lawrence's idea. That was his song, he wrote that song. And I never wanted to do that song. I didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> it was not something that I wanted to do. And he had, oh, you sound great doing, this is the perfect song for you. We actually battled for quite some time on that. And finally I did it just, you know, so he'd stay off my case. And actually now I appreciate it a lot more than I did then. And I don't know, um, I thought, I don't know, I maybe because of where I was, I was a, a mother and, you know, how, what would my children think? I, I think that was the concept in my mind if they were to hear that on the radio, but it's just a song. <laughs> it's yeah. just a song <laughs> that should have universal appeal. So, you know, my, actually my son, he used to listen to that song a lot when he was maybe eight, nine years old because I did have a copy and I would play those songs quite a bit at home or in the car. And that was one of the songs he really liked. <laughs> I mean, the music is fantastic. 
And whoever played keyboards, did you have the same keyboard player on all of them? I don't know. I think Lawrence handled all of the music. Okay. So he, I wouldn't be surprised if he played the keyboards. Maybe. On. Yeah, maybe. So, um, I, but I don't know who, who the musicians were that he used. Right. Okay. Yeah, I couldn't find anything written. There was nothing written on the cassette except your name right. performances, um, that he wrote on it. I always believed he played the keyboards on it. Well, he was very good. Yeah. He actually told me to go and get some keys. So he, he, because of him, I went out and got some, yeah. Me, I'm not a musician. I got a Yamaha something and I was banging on it. And <laughs> He said, yeah, you need to get you some keyboards because I wrote a song and he said, come, come over. I'll do the music. He did the music for the song. We recorded it. And then I just forgot. I got bored. <laughs> so I, I got bored and I went into fashion. Oh. He said, come on. Do so he did it. He was like that. He wanted to support people. And right. said, this was what you wanted to do. He tried to help. Right. Hmm. Interesting. But I love that. I like when you do that run. I don't know. I guess it's called a run on Dark Side of the Moon. You go dark, dark. I can't sing it, but you do the dark, 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 dark. <laughs> you know the part I'm talking about. Yeah. I love that part. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I hope it comes. I mean, I hope something happens with it. I do too. I, I, my son and I are already um, brainstorming on what we're going to do with um, some. I actually have done some uh, more current things with him. And so um, I was in Los Angeles actually when we were corresponding about the dates. Yeah. And I was like, you said eight hours. I'm eight hours ahead of you. And I'm like, eight hours? How could that possibly be? But I didn't realize you didn't know, you didn't realize that I was not in the West Coast, or not on the West Coast, I'm on the East Coast. Oh, so that's why I said there's, you know, I responded and said there's only like, I, I got the East, I mean, the the East Coast to Britain thing down, because I watch a lot of <laughs> British shows. Do you? Oh, yes. 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 <laughs> So, I mean, you know, like I watch uh, East Enders Daily and Coronation Street and Emmerdale. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You're you're a Brit now. I mean, well, well, you know what? Before COVID, that was my bucket list that I was going to go over. Because I'm closer now than I was when I was in California. Yes. So I had decided, you know what? I'm going to go this summer. And then COVID hit. Oh. And so that's just like, whoop, but it's still on my bucket list. Good. And I'm still going to watch my British shows. <laughs> oh, so I love East Enders, always have. Yeah, yeah, can't wait till you come over here. <laughs> Never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button right now. Thank you for your support. You make this podcast possible. Now, back to the show. Prompted the move from from the West Coast to the East Coast. Well, it wasn't like I just jumped up and said I'm moving to New York. I worked in the fashion industry for many many years. Actually, when I met you, I was working in the fashion industry. I was just you know I was a jack of many trades. <laughs> so I had a full time job. I was a mother. I, at the time, I was a mother and a wife. Because that was 87 or 88, yeah. so I was a mother and a wife, and I was, you know, trying to pursue a singing career as well, and songwriting. So, um, my, I lost both of my parents between 20, 2008 and 2010, mm -hmm. and um, when I buried my father, I said to my girlfriend, just hypothetically, <laughs> I can travel the world as I please now because I do not have anything that's keeping me here. My children were adults by then, and it was just me. And so, but I really was just saying that, you know, <laughs> just, just trying to keep from crying. And um, about a year and a half later, I was in the process of moving from one place to another into my uh, the home I grew up in. And... I received this call and 
I just kind of said, well, I, I, the person said, well, she would love to work with you. And I said, in New York. And I said, well, I would do that in a heartbeat. And, you know, thinking that, that would never happen anyway. And then the rest is history. <laughs> so I was offered a position. I took it. <laughs> One day they, they called me to uh, come in to, they flew me out for an interview. I didn't, I wasn't sure what was going to happen. So I went back to California, but within a week they had made up their, made their decision. And when they gave me the green light, I told my son, you know, I'm going to take this job. If they, uh, if I don't like it, I'll return. But if I like it, I'll stay. I didn't really think I would stay this long. So, you know, I had a pretty good run. I had 10 years there. And it kind of worked out. COVID came along and hit. Um, it wasn't very good for anybody, you know, and, and everyone's job was on the line, not just in our company, but every company in every industry. But you know what? When you just sit and be still and watch what happens, it was time. This was going to be my last job anyway, because it was time for me to maybe retire <laughs> and just worked out. <laughs> so now I have more time to write. <laughs> More time to write songs, more time to write stories. So that's what I've been doing lately, that's writing. Amazing. Yes. And you're, with your writing, are you writing stories, you're saying, as well? So are you looking to write a book or? Yes. I have some things, you know, I've, I've written quite a few pieces. I just, I'm in the process of uh, putting together some chapbooks and my niece and my son keep saying that I should write a story about my life. I'm like, I don't know why, but. <laughs> yeah, you must have worked with some really interesting people. Well, I think we all work with interesting people, to be <laughs> honest with you. I mean, in, in every profession, there are very interesting people. We are all characters in every story. Um, and sometimes the characters don't change just the names of the characters. <laughs> I never really knew I could write, you know, stories and do storytelling until I had dabbled it in when I was living in California. So I had began the process. I was in a, a writing and performance class. So we'd write our stories and then we would perform them um, in front of an audience, actually. And uh, that's when I first started doing it. And I loved it. And then when I moved to New York, I had to, you know, get my boundaries and figure things out and how to get around the city and where to go. And so then I did take a couple of classes, and but it was a different thing. It was like a storytelling, just being a writer. So I took a couple of classes, but it was just difficult trying to leave the office and make it to the, to the session in time, in a timely manner, not being late. I don't really like to be late. So that was kind of difficult. And then I just kind of went away. I'm like, I'm just, that's just too much. <laughs> and so I just put it to the side, but I stayed on their email list and it came in very handy when COVID hit. And then I joined their Zoom workshops and I've been like on it ever since. <laughs> that's fantastic. So you are probably born creative. I mean, but what are your thoughts? Do you think people are born with creativity or can you learn? Because all, your life has been about creating. <laughs> I think we are all born with the gifts that um, we, we're all born with God given gifts. You know, sometimes we don't know what gifts we possess. But um, for me, it was, you know, what I liked. I like reading and I like storytelling and I like music. I love music and I love, you know, being able to see people's response to music and how um, you can make a song resonates with so many people on so many different levels. But then I could sew, you know, I could sew, um, I knew how to sew. <laughs> Probably like my mother would make all of my clothes um, when I was in junior high school, but I knew from the time I was in this fifth grade that I wanted to be 
a fashion designer. I didn't know that there were so many other it, uh, areas in that field, but I knew in the fifth grade that I wanted to be a fashion designer. And my mother told me I had to do an autobiography in class, and and my and I didn't know what to you know what possibilities I could have. I mean, what was open for me? Um, a little black girl and the United States and what fields they were for us other than cosmetology, uh, being a secretary or being a nurse. That was basically the fields for us. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really have no interest in any of them. <laughs> so, but my mother said, you should, you should be a fashion designer because you love clothes so much <laughs> that you could solve two problems at one time. And that's where the ideal came. And then I realized that I loved clothing, but I had no clue of how they were constructed. And so my mother would make my clothes from 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, ninth, And in the 10th grade, I took a sewing class. And in the first semester, I was just a regular student. In the second semester, second half of the semester, the teacher made her me her assistant over even some of the seniors. But I think it was just the natural ability for me to be able to construct in my mind how, how pieces go together. And then I would go on and take some classes to enhance you know, my, my sewing ability and understanding the language of the fashion industry. And so it, it actually was beneficial for me longer in the long run than I, I majored in it in, in junior college. Amazing, that journey sort of thing from, and then right into fashion as well, and mm -hmm. then moved to New York. And is that where you met your husband? Because we want to talk about the great Robin Harris, if we can. Um, I met him in Los Angeles. Oh. Yeah, we met in Los Angeles at an open mic night one night. And um, we became friends. We exchanged numbers that night. Actually, the minute I walked into the, um, into the club, he started, <laughs> what most people know of him, he likes to talk about, he liked to talk about people the minute you walk through the door. So he started in on me immediately. I didn't know him and he didn't know me. And afterwards he came over and, you know, apologized, introduced himself and we exchanged numbers and we became friends. And um, that was basically it for a couple of years. <laughs> Oh, no. Many people believe that we had started date. We were dating. We would go out together sometime, but we weren't dating. Okay. So uh, don't ask me about um, how that all came about. I have to save that at another time. <laughs> it can go into your memoirs. Your yeah, book. that's where it's going to go. <laughs> yeah. But uh, viewers and listeners out there, Robin Harris uh, was, because he has now transitioned to the spirit and he was a famous actor comedian very well versed uh just amazing stand-up comic as well he was in lots of different films um and let me see i did write some of the i'm gonna get you sucker i remember that off the top of my head that was his first film yes oh that was his first okay yeah that was his first do the right thing harlem nights house party mo better blues just you just knew him his face um you know because he has a very distinct look and your son oh my goodness he <laughs> looks so much like him. i'm sure everybody says that yeah he does look like a lot like him and his mannerisms are the same as well really yeah many of his mannerisms but you know I suppose when we talk about love and lost and we've all lost people in our lives when we partner with people it's the last thing on our minds that's that right somebody's gonna go or you're gonna separate people don't get together to think about losing mm -mm. no so how 
did you manage? Um, he may have been had some health issues that were not um, known to him or to us, but he wasn't ill. Um, the day that it happened, actually it's, that time is approaching because March the 18th is the morning that he died. Um, I was completely devastated. Um, it took me a long time to get over the loss. Um, my emotions were all over the place. I was pregnant. I don't even believe I was three months pregnant. And I had an eight-year-old. He was either seven or eight. I can't remember at this time. But it was... You know, you think about the child and trying to protect him and his emotions and trying to be there for him, never even thinking about your own, you know, your own feelings. So it was, a, it was a long, it's been a long process. And then what comes out of that is the unborn child that doesn't even know his parent or father in his case. He would, I mean, they... My children are like godsons. I have two sons. They are 11 years apart. But I am thankful that God gave me those two because they are so well mannered and they know as a unit that we can move through things and communicate our feelings and without anyone getting upset so it's been it's been difficult but it's also been joyous so it's it was a long road a long road but like you said no one thinks about the loss so once i finally began to heal over the loss of my husband i still had my children i began to realize that life goes on regardless but soon as I got to that place of feeling joy again then I lost my mother and I you know it was I lost my mother but again I had to be the one who stood up for the family because my mother was the rock for us all and so I had to jump in and fill her shoes and to help my father navigate through his loss. And, you know, I, I'm surprised I actually did it, but you'd be surprised what God allows you to do. And you'd be surprised how far you can go when you're not even thinking about it. I just did what I was supposed, what I felt that I was supposed to do. And I, I guess God just navigated me <laughs> Where I was going, he led the way. And then a couple of years later, I lost my dad. But I realized that we're only here temporarily on this earth. And so we are going to, to have loved ones that we love so dearly. But they're not here for eternity. And they're not here for the amount of time that we think they should be. And so you just have to be, you know, be mindful of that. Be mindful and be thankful for the time that you did share with them. Be mindful and thankful for the memories that you created. And although you can never, you know, time is of the essence of everything. You have to live each day as if, as if it's your last. And so whatever you're doing or going through, not to worry about what's ahead, the unknown. Because trust me, it was only by faith that I am here today. Because I could have gone and had a mental breakdown. I, you know, I, there's so many possibilities, but I didn't. I persevered. And I'm still able to, you know, have to walk, talk, <laughs> use all of my limbs, go wherever I please, and I'm thankful for that. So, That's 
amazing. But that is a huge loss. And you're right, absolutely. Nobody's here forever. No. I believe our soul, soul moves on, but that's a belief system I have. Um, and some people can feel people around them. Right. You know. Right. Do you ever get that feeling that sort of Robin's watching or around or maybe a little joke comes up or remember? Yeah, yeah, I, I do. You know, it's, it's um, and it's not just him. I mean, it's my mother, my father. You know, once you, those people that you love so dearly, once they transition, it becomes <laughs> a daily thing of having at least one or two or three of them on your mind daily. And so you, you reminisce and you remember they bring smiles to your face when something, even in the last 30 days, I've had dreams that I woke up and I said, oh my God, what was that dream about? Someone's going to, you know, they're going to transition and join the ancestors. And I'm surprised it actually happened. The dream may, may not have made sense to me at that time, but I know that there's a spirit out there. But those spirits will live in our dreams. They'll protect you in times of storms. And, you know, when you feel like, oh, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. And, you know, I did enough of that when I was younger. And all of the worrying and all of the despair and <laughs> nothing happened. The world didn't end. <laughs> right. The world didn't end. And I woke up the next day and still kept going. Now, things may have changed. And then again, things may not have changed. But at some point, when when the time for the blessings to arrive, it's not when we want them. It's how it's ordained for us to receive them. So, you know, I'm just thankful because sure, I could have did a lot of things when my husband died, but I didn't. Um, moving to New York, many that couldn't see why I would move to New York in my 50s. <laughs> but I'm still here. So and many asked, well, when are you coming back? Are you ever coming back? And I'm like, yeah, I'll come back. But one thing's for sure. I will be back at the closing because I have a plot. <laughs> at Inglewood Park Cemetery. <laughs> but I mean, the reality of it is, is I don't know what's going to happen. I'm just going to follow God and let Him guide me, and He's going to provide whatever I need when I need it. I don't need much now. I don't have to have all the latest gear and <laughs> drive the best car. And none of that. <laughs> It's as long as I can get up and move around on a daily basis and eat, that's all that matters. Exactly. I'm with you on that one. <laughs> if you're enjoying the show so far, here's your chance to subscribe and support the channel. Hit that like button and also, very importantly, leave me a comment wherever you are listening or watching. Even if you just put an emoji, it lets us know that you're with us. Here's your countdown. Thanks for your support. Now back to the show. Now, there is a Robin Harris Foundation that you started in his name. Can you tell us a bit about that? Well, I started the foundation to pay tribute to him um, after his death. Yes. Yeah. And um, we wanted to empower, educate, create, and motivate youth living in underserved communities through mentorships, resources to healthy heart nutrition, and enhanced character development to reach their highest potential. Um, we've been, up until COVID hit, we had um, the Robin Harris Comedy 
tribute every year um, in Los Angeles. And so, you know, it was a comedy show. We raised funds and we would donate that money to an organization who fell, of, fell under the umbrella of, you know, our mission statement. Um, I don't know when we're going to get back to doing the tribute again. Um, like I said, COVID kind of put everything on hold, and so I'm not there now, and it's so in Los Angeles. So I'm just we're just trying to navigate um, what we're going to be doing next. So my son's been working with me, so getting gearing up to, you know, when I step down, he he'll be in charge. So we're just going through that transition right now. And we thought it would be something to commemorate him, you know, his talents, and to give back to the community when we can. Yeah. And if people want to get involved, can they donate um, to the cause? Do they go? I'll put a link in the show notes to the website as well, listeners, uh, so you can go there. But I think you can donate, can't you? Can you? Yes. You can go online, www the robin harris foundation dot org and um donate if you like and that helps to support really does help that helps support yeah that helps support too the foundation yeah so but that's an amazing memory to have set up and i'm sure he'd be proud <laughs> so i mean well done for doing that but thank you we've lost a great talent there and um you know, but I'm a firm believer in when it's our time, it's our time. It doesn't really help with our grief, I don't believe. No. Uh, no. Coming to that acceptance maybe lifts a bit of that pressure we can feel that we've got to get it all in before we... Yeah. Away, cause yeah. It is, we don't know when it's going to happen. Yeah. So, um, now, I also want to talk a little bit about your music career we're just going to go back to that a little bit who were some of the people that you worked with besides lines because you've done a lot of different projects and lots of different things well i have did some um on the local scene in los angeles i was an opening act for um bb king and actually albert king the night Night before Robin passed, I was on the Albert King show, um, and I did some some work with backup work with Hiroshima. Wow! Um, years ago, mm -hmm. I did one a, a recording with them. Mm. That fusion jazz sort of fusion mix it's wonderful, fantastic. And then were you looking, were you doing some backup as well for other people? Or were you just going to try and now be yourself? Both. Mm -hmm. Both. But, you know, once Robin passed away, I kind of just, you know, just backed away from that. Plus, I was pregnant at the time. So, pregnant and on strict bed rest. So, that meant I couldn't do anything. <laughs> so, you know, I had to regroup and... I attempted to do it um, after I had my my younger son for a little while, but then my my older son started high school and he was you know in activities in high school. He played football, and so you know I had to make a decision: mm -hmm. you either be a supportive parent or you be a absentee parent and I thought that it was more important to be a supportive parent than the absentee I had to make time I it was only me so I had to do everything so I had to you know you can't just do such and such and so and so because you have children and they have to be looked after and you have to feed them and you have to be there for them so that was my choice and I would say I'm glad I made that choice um, it was very helpful in their development and in, in any kid's development. They want their parents' support. So, you know, it, it was a no brainer for me. So I had to kind of put singing on hold and, you know, concentrate on my sons. Yes. I mean, prioritize. That's what, yep. how we learn in life. Mm -hmm. 
you know, being a single mother can be challenging for, for anyone. Um, and, you know, I suppose in some ways our listeners will gain a lot of strength from listening to how you've gone from strength to strength, literally. So and the choices you've made. To be perfectly honest with you, I don't even know how I made it. <laughs> I just did it and I didn't complain. I did it. I had some help though. I mean, it, I didn't do it alone. I did have a few people who I knew my trusted, most of my parents. Um, they helped me quite a bit, especially after Robin died. I had one in high school and one, uh, you know, they're 11 years apart. So when, when the younger one started kindergarten, I needed help, you know, getting him back and forth to school on a daily basis. My mother retired at, when he started kindergarten, so she was the help. Or both of my parents were the help at that time. But I always had some extra help with my children, even when the older one was an, an only child. But, you know, being a, being a single mother is no joke. You have to take on the weight of being, uh, you have to take on the weight of everything, of everyone, the mother and the father. If your father, if you're the mother and the father, and the father is, you know, deceased, what alternatives do you have? If you have an absentee father, then you have to make excuses for him. I mean, there's so many possibilities here, but if you are the mother, you just move move ahead. And if you ch do the best that you can do, and that's all you can do, it's going to work out. Your children will thank you for it one day. And, and I only, I'm saying this from experience because my older son, if I would have allowed him to just do his own thing, he would probably be in prison right now. But because I put my foot down to so many things, he thinks me on a regular basis, whether in a text message or <laughs> call. Um, it makes a difference. And, um, you know, luckily for me, I had both of my parents. I had both of my parents until I was, you know, well up in age. My sons have, <laughs> I was a single mother twice. So, you know, when I say twice, I mean my sons don't have the same father. So the oldest one, when he was three, his father died. And then... My youngest one, his father died before he was even three months in, as an embryo. So I've been, uh, that single mother thing, I got it down now. <laughs> and I'm not laughing, but it's just how life is. We, we have to take the unexpected and do the best that we can do with it. Absolutely. And, you know, I mean, laughter is healing as well. I mean, yes. the absurdity of life. Yeah. We can look at our lives and go, wait, how did that happen? It's like a comedy. <laughs> you know, oh, yes, it is. <laughs> hey, wait, hang on, twice? <laughs> twice. <laughs> I've never said that out, out loud. Only people who are very close to me know that. Like my family members, very close friends. But the general public does not know that that has happened twice. Yeah, but I think that's going to help some people. Uh, because it may have happened to others as well. Yeah. And, you know, we exactly. do, absolutely, but we lose people sometimes, maybe not to, to death, but we may lose them in other ways. Right. You're so, that is so true. So true. So, so true. And incarceration is one of them. They, they are literally away. They're gone. Um, yeah. You know, substance abuse. Substance abuse. Um, Mental health. Mental health is a huge homelessness. Homelessness, huge. Um, you know, there are so many, so many things, and you know, as human beings, we always feel. I would say most, many of us feel that we paint a picture of our lives in our mind, and that picture is beautiful. The picture is, 
you know, I'm going to get married one day and have a white house with a white picket fence. And we're going to have X amount of children. And my occupation will be this. And my spouse's occupation will be that. And our combined income will be six figures. We'll be able to live the fabulous life. But that's not how life is. <laughs> Life, <laughs> the one thing that life is, is life is what you make it. <laughs> yeah, that's a fantasy, though. We all have. Exactly, a exactly. <laughs> Reality may look very different. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, you just have to take, um, if, if you have a life that's perfect like that, God bless you. I'm rooting for you all the way. But in, in reality, most people's lives have never been that way. Absolutely. And, you know, we learn from the challenges and the struggles. How can you be a blessing, really, to somebody else if you've got no experience of a challenge, uh, any kind of loss or heartache? This is how we learn to help others. Yeah, yeah. And you've only lived when your heart's been broken more than once. <laughs> Exactly, but and for various things, <laughs> you know, yeah, from various things. Yes, people think about love, but you know, there are so many things that break your heart is unbelievable. Exactly, break your heart. So exactly, lots of things. Yeah. That is so amazing. That's so true. I wanted to quickly ask you about nurturing justice. Okay, so the website is www. dot nurturingjustice. dot org. Okay. And, and their mission is to promote the dignity of all humanity and expose the fallacy of white skin supremacy and promote the notion that there is no hierarchy of human value based on skin color. That's incredible. And how they achieve this mission is through education, action, community building, and engagement. And how, what is your part in, in nurturing justice? Well, actually, I um, one of the ministers at my church actually is um, the CEO of, uh, or the founder of the, of the um, organization. And um, I've participated in two, no, maybe more than that, maybe two or three class sessions. And it's, you know, it's a round table of expressing ideas and trying to overcome the boundaries of white supremacy and to learn from the experiences. It's very fascinating to me to be in a group when, you know, it's majority white and it's majority whites who understand their whiteness. Yes. They have a uh, you know, chosen priorities, you know, <laughs> so. Is it privilege? Privilege they tend to have. Their white privilege, yeah. Their white privilege. They understand their white privilege. And they just want to work through and understand and have dialogue with those who are not like them, you know, and to understand why they feel that way. So I just find it something that's very fulfilling for me because I'm in this group environment and these people want to learn and they want to move ahead and they know that you know white supremacy is not just only in America it's around the world so you know it's it's something that has to do with anyone who's of color and anyone who's of European descent so you know we all need to in, in order to move forward we have to understand our past and we have to understand how we even got here. So that's why I am a big uh, believer in, I support nurturing justice. Sounds fantastic. I'm yeah. going to put the links uh, in the show notes, guys, that you can go to www.nurturingjustice.org and have a look at everything they're doing and get involved and you know, really, because this this topic, it, you know, the past few years, it seems to have blown up, but actually, yeah. <laughs> it never stopped. This has gone on since I was born, you know, 
and I, I personally don't believe racism will go away because it's always going to be a class. There will always be, always be this class system and people thinking they're above other people. And that's a myth. Exactly. And so people use anything. They use money to separate. They use color to separate. They use gender to separate. Mm -hmm. Women, men, men stronger. Uh, they, they will use where you live. To separate education, education, huge one, education, mm -hmm. and I don't believe that will ever stop. So, but as you were saying, we have to get on top of it. We have to be aware, and I have to say, I'm inspired to hear that a lot of white people are participating in the nurturing justice. Yeah, and you know, I think what people need to understand too: all white people are not are, are not racist. You know, some people seem to think all white people are racist. Well, I know a few black people who are racist too. So, you know, where do you draw the line? And there is this whole notion out there as well that black people can't be racist. <laughs> you know, I hear that from a lot of people say, oh, but black people can't. If you look at the definition of racism, black people can't be racist. So there's this whole thing out there. So right. I grew up in a family where we were taught, look, nobody's better or worse. Right. It was always power, black power when I was growing up. And we thought we were the thing, the stuff. Yeah. You know, yeah. That doesn't make you better than there because you've got an afro. It doesn't make you better than everybody else. But we thought we were it. Exactly. And everybody wanted to do the afro and everybody. So, yeah, but as you were talking, because I could go on about that, but as you were saying, that will always be there. Everywhere you go, there will be pockets of people, but not everyone is where. I started this podcast just interviewing my friends, and you'll see a huge mix of people. <laughs> and they're my friends, so... Oh. Yeah, every wow. and some black people may be prejudiced or racist, especially in places. Yeah, have you got any other projects coming up? Anything we need to look out for besides hopefully praying some music? <laughs> well, uh, the music is in the works. Um, I'm working with my my younger son. On some music and um, also um, music for myself and he's asked me to help write some songs for him so um, we're doing that and then like I said I'm working on some um, book and chat book so hopefully I'll have two chat books and, and um, either a memoir and a, and a novel Oh, ooh. that would be fantastic. Yeah. People always think we have to use our lives. That's nice. Uh, but you, novels, you know, fiction can be very creative. You can use bits of yourself in it. Yes, yes, yes. I have a story I'm working on. So, I'm, you know, I'm, it's just in development. But so far, those who have read the piece of <laughs> they're wanting more, so I'm gonna I'm gonna continue to work on it until I have full manuscript. Wonderful. I did want to quickly before we go, um, Robin. He would have worked with some amazing people, and have they ha, have they has he been remembered within the entertainment field? Have people reached out? What's I would say he's been remembered. But I think that there could be a, a, a larger way to remember him. Um, it's kind of like behind the scenes remembrance that I hear through a few people. And, um, and then a few people, have, a few projects have included them, have included him. And his and their uh, production, um, Fat Tuesdays came out last year on Amazon Prime, so they did a large 
um, tribute to Robin, I think, for, I don't know how many minutes, but it was, I was quite surprised. I mean, they had contacted me and asked me about doing it, but I really didn't think it was going to be as long as it is. But it, it is quite, I mean, it's a small tribute, but it's, to me, kind of powerful. But I think that, um, you know, when people transition, they get lost. A lot of times they're, um, they get lost. Robin was just at the point beginning his career on the large scale. And so although many people remember him, there's not very much footage at that time because this was like, you know, pre video on phones and pre um, streaming and all of that. So, you know, it's, the, people know of him basically from the movies. Actually, it's interesting because the generation or two generations after his death are beginning to recognize him. And that's from House Party. Um, more so from House Party because younger people have a tendency to watch, you know, kid, kid movies and baby's kids. So those two has, you know, drawn younger generations. Um, I, I remember one guy <laughs> had contacted me and he said he grew up on watching Bay Bay's Kids all summer once when he was growing up because every summer because his family would go on, you know, camping trips and they would bring that tape along and that's, that was his entertainment. And uh, that was kind of surprising. But, you know, a lot of people remember Robin. And um, they remember his talent. There are some that have actually seen him perform in person um, he, that I've run across here in New York that I was like, oh my God, <laughs> you know. Um, in the heyday of the Comedy Act Theater, which he was instrumental in helping put on the map, was the... Um, it was the first black comedy venue for black comedians in the 80s. And so he was the host and he, you know, it grew. It took a few years, but it grew. But they, a lot of talent came out of that, that venue. And not just Robin. I mean, there are so many talented people who came through the Comedy Act Union. Um, that it's now is just they're big stars now, big com either comedy or actors. So it was a feel for them to not just Robin, you know, to get their feet wet in comedy, but it was a place for black comedians to be, instead of going up to Hollywood to the comedy store and the white clubs where they would have to wait all night to just get on the show at the comedy. Uh, not the comedy union, uh, <laughs> the comedy act. <laughs> There's two different clubs and two different eras, and I'm thinking of the comedy act theater. It was a ground. It was it was the playground for all the black acts to come, all the black stars and athletes. They all came to the comedy act theater, in in the late '80s. Um, so if you were anybody a who's who of black Hollywood, on a Thursday night, you were there. Wow. That was the hottest ticket in town. And, and because of that, it gave us a playing field to go and mingle amongst our people. And then when, when it became hot, then Hollywood agents and managers wanted to start coming. They started coming down to the, to the Crenshaw area to see what was going on. And they, they were coming, it started with, they came to see who the hot comedian was, which, who was Robin. But there were so many other talented artists, Martin Lawrence, um, uh, uh, Keenan Ivy Waynes. Um, there were so many people, Jamie Foxx, Joe Torrey, I mean, there's so many people that came through uh, Michael Coyer. They all came through the Comedy Act Theater because that was home for them. 
So I'm glad to see so many, even though Robin has transitioned, I'm glad to see that so many of are getting their um, are getting their flowers now. And happy. Once they had the riots in 92, people didn't really want to go in that area because that was the area where the riots after Rodney King riots, that was the area that it happened in. So people were skeptical about going over there. And then they started venturing out into other places, Hollywood, but they had other spots to go to. And by then, you know, um, that is how Fat Tuesdays, if you get a chance, you can watch it on um, yeah. Amazon Prime. I'm going to put uh, a link, guys, in the, in the uh, notes as well. Yeah, that is how, um, you know, it was Fat Tuesdays on Tuesday night. You learn the history of that. And because that crowd grew so much, it was the biggest money maker of the club all week, they gave them the main room. So, I mean, you, you learn the history of that. And then there was the, the Laugh Factory. There's a few other spots that had comedy after Robin's death in the late 90s, 2000s. So there's, there's a, a lot of history. There's a lot of comics now. As when Robin was living, there weren't as many comics as they are now. <laughs> Many of them are excellent. You know, it's, it's just some are not good. But you know what? doesn't mean that you can't make it. You it's just work on your craft until you finally arrive. That's the key. Hold that's the key. Craft. Hold your craft. I mean, yeah. that's helpful. Because many people think that you can just step on stage, tell a few kitchen table jokes. No. Uh-uh. I've seen, um, I've seen many step on that stage at, at the Comedy Act and had no material. And... Many years later, they're headliners. But there we go. You know, it's not like it can't be done because it can. Yes. And everybody Always, something. Yeah. If, if you have a dream or a desire to do something, just keep working and keep working and keep working. And eventually, your time will come. Patience is the key. And keep working. As you said, hone your craft. Keep working at it. Yes. And people, I think people need to hear that. Because everybody yes. in this day and age wants instant, 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 instant. You know, like that. And they yeah. Can't. Well, in most, in most cases, most people who, uh, it takes people many times in their you know, 10, 20, 30 years in a, in a profession before they, you know, are awarded with their flowers. And if you get it early on, that's great. But for some, we, you know, they have to wait a long time. Absolutely. And, you know, Robin's legacy will live on uh, because his work's been... It's now immortalized. It's in. It's on film. It's there. And if there's clips out there, if anybody's watching this, if you somehow recorded something, please send Exeta. I will put her uh, Instagram. Oh well, I want to ask you about that because your Instagram is private. Should people go to? Where should they go if they want to contact you? Actually, you're absolutely right. <laughs> My Instagram is private because I was hacked. <laughs> and so I had to change that. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. And my son says, you know, you're pretty uh, computer savvy. If you can stay on Twitter all day long. <laughs> so someone hacked me and he's like, you need to change that. You, you have to stay off the social media. You can't be on social media like that, so I had to change. Just send it to either my Instagram or um, Twitter. Both are private, but if they're sending me something based from the show, I would say put a red flag. <laughs> there we go, guys, because you never know what could be out there bootlegs of, of a show you just never people, people yeah just never know so if if there's any footage of robin uh, out there stage anything please let exeter know and and forward it to her 
and also put it if you're sending me something put in the uh in the topic line of the inquisitive okay yeah. <laughs> yeah, put, put the podcast name in and then yeah. you come from here because you know you never know at the 80s 90s people were recording by loads of different ways so oh yeah tiny camera <laughs> I mean, we're more savvy now, but, you know, even pictures, I would say, if you have pictures of Robin in, in, in any of the comedy clubs or anything, or pictures with him, you guys, we all have pictures from long ago. So if you met him, let, let Exeter know. I think she, you know, you, you'd love to hear from them, wouldn't you? Yes. Yeah, send some photos over as well. That would be nice, because we want to keep his memory alive. It is alive, but we... You know, he was an artist. He's an art. This is an artistic family, and um, and we just want to keep that energy that he brought along going. So let's keep it going. <laughs> Exella, thank you so much for being here. Oh my goodness! Thank you for having me. My heart is so full, and I think Lawrence brought us together. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm sticking to that. I think he did. <laughs> And um, I wish you all the best. It's so good to see you. It's been many, many years. And I'm going to look out for the new music and everything else that's going on. All the links will be in the show notes, guys, to contact um, the Robin Harris Foundation and also nurturingjustice.org. And um, we look forward to hearing more from you in the future. Well, thank you. You can okay. listen on Apple Podcasts and you can watch this video on YouTube. This has been a fantastic talk. I've really enjoyed it. I think you've, you've dropped some real gems. Oh, okay. thank you. And I enjoyed it too. I hope to see you soon. Hope to see you soon. Your mental health is a priority. Nine Pitches Therapies offers gentle and soothing therapy for your mind, body, and soul. These self-help recordings focus on improving the quality of your life by providing you what you need right now, be it confidence, positivity, restful sleep, or relaxation. The soothing, calming music has been specially composed to accompany the body of words created by me, an expert in this field, to help you to achieve the best result. Reprogram your mind using the most gentle and effective guided meditations that can help you to clear and cleanse any unwanted energy that may be negatively affecting your life. Improve the quality of your life in just a few minutes a day. Nine Peaches Therapies, Holistic Therapeutic Consultancy. Thanks so much for listening today. Make sure you subscribe and follow on all streaming platforms. Leave me a comment and also let me know if there's any particular topics you'd like me to discuss. See you next time.